Okay, I only have 10 minutes, so I'll bullet point through some things. Are, are, or are you tired of hearing new theories about the 14th Amendment? I don't know, are you, are you tired of all the old theories about the 14th Amendment? Uh, uh, my paper here is uh, kind of a, a new theory approach of, to interpreting the 14th Amendment. As you can see, it's very much a work in progress. I'm uncertain of many of my conclusions. In fact, I'm uncertain of many of my premises. So, so don't, don't circulate this thing. Don't quote me on this, because I really think that it'll emerge a lot different after this conference than the way it started out. Um, I'm very much unsettled as to how this theory, which I generally think is right, would apply when rubber hits the road to a variety of issues. And, and the comments I've already received from people in emails were saying, well, but wouldn't this imply this? Wouldn't this imply this? Oh, you're wrong to have this application of it. And I think that's probably where many of the questions and comments will come from. What I'd like to do in my 10 minutes is to spend about five laying out the general thesis, the proposition, and then five, speculating as to its application. So I've given you this little handout, which is what I do when I teach uh, uh, presentations so that students can follow along and know how close I am to, to getting finished. The basic thesis is that everything we think about how to go about interpreting the 14th Amendment is wrong, that it kind of proceeds from the false premise that the indeterminacy of the language invites broad-scale judicial interpretation, and then we argue about uh, what is the proper breadth of judicial interpretation of the 14th Amendment. And my basic starting point is that textual indeterminacy, which I think you have to concede for the 14th Amendment, that textual indeterminacy uh, has radically different implications when it serves as a grant of enumerated legislative power which is what I'm going to argue the 14th Amendment is in, in main part, and when it's uh, understood as uh, an exercise of judicial power. Okay? The 14th Amendment specifically grants Congress a sweeping power to enact civil rights legislation uh, that Congress judges to be appropriate for carrying into execution some pretty broad and general language concerning prohibitions on state conduct. And I think that the 14th Amendment in that sense confers huge, enormous, congressional interpretive power to implement and execute the general commands. The corollary is that the 14th Amendment requires the judiciary to enforce Congress's judgments and requires the judiciary, because of the self-executing core of Section 1, uh, to enforce that co core whether Congress enforces it or not. But that beyond that judicial minimum, a lot of what the judiciary has done and purports to do in the name of the 14th Amendment because of broad general language must be regarded as, at best, uh, provisional and subject to Congress's power to essentially overrule the Supreme Court's purported constitutional interpretations. Okay, so here's the argument in a nutshell. Uh, part two is like, what do you do when there are indeterminate constitutional texts? Now, as the paper is written out, I've kind of reversed A and B on the outline that's there. My first premise is that the power of judicial review uh, assumes that something that the legislature or the executive branch has done is actually in irreconcilable conflict with, directly contrary to some rule of law stated in, authoritatively in the text of the Constitution. It seems to follow from that that the more indeterminate or underdeterminate a constitutional text, the less strongly you can say that any legislative act is contrary to it. If a provision has a range of meanings, okay, if there's some indeterminacy, and the legislature has adopted a policy choice falling within the range of fair interpretation of that constitutional text, there is very little warrant for the judiciary in validating what it's done. The premise of the argument for judicial review in Marbury versus Madison and in Federalist Number 78 is that what the legislature has done is contrary to a rule supplied by the text of the Constitution. You can't say, say really that it's contrary to rule if there were a range of choices admitted by the text. Now, the corollary proposition, which I have there as subpoint A, is that when there's a broad, ambiguous, open-ended text and it comes in the form of a grant of legislative power, the governing rule of our legal system has been that you must construe those grants of power generously. And actually, you can see how these fit together. Okay, the text has a range of meaning. The legislature has adopted a rule within the scope of the text. 
you have to defer to what the legislature has chosen. So our broad rule of deference, uh, uh, starting from McCulloch versus Maryland, is that where Congress has chosen a policy within the range of a broadly granted power, it gets to do what it wants. It gets to choose what is appropriate legislation for carrying that into execution. Now, the thing with the 14th Amendment is it is both a prohibition on state conduct and a grant of legislative power. How do you go about interpreting that? Now, I start from interpreting the 14th Amendment as a grant of power. If you read the 14th Amendment without the corrupting influence of all the judicial cases we've read purporting to interpret it, and if you read it in its context as a grant of power, how would you most naturally read it? And I think that as a matter of originalist premises, text, structure, history, early precedent, early interpretation, you would view it as an extraordinarily broad grant of power to Congress to implement a series of very generally worded, indefinite, open-ended restrictions on what states can do. And I proceed to work to develop that as a matter of text, structure, analogy from prior language interpreting um, uh, uh, McCulloch versus Maryland, the parallelism between the Section 5 Enforcement Clause and the Section 2 Enforcement Clause of the 13th Amendment, and eventually I'll get to writing up that history and precedent. Uh, Earl Maltz's book has been tremendously helpful to me in getting that uh, clear. The conclusion you end up with is that the objective meaning of the words of the Constitution when read through the prism of a grant of power give Congress an enormous power to instantiate the indeterminacy in terms of its choice of concrete policies and that the courts then have an obligation to enforce what Congress has chosen. So that brings me to how you would view judicial power to interpret the 14th Amendment. First and foremost, it must uphold broad congressional interpretations falling within the scope of that grant. It is a broad Section 5 enforcement power. Because the 14th Amendment is structured not merely as a grant of legislative power, but also a self-executing prohibition, the judiciary shall enforce Section 1 to, uh, in addition. Okay? It is directly judicially enforceable to the extent it supplies reasonably determinate rules of law so that what you can, you can actually say that what the state has done is contrary to the necessary, irreducible core meaning of Section 1. Okay. But that's a much narrower understanding of the judicial power than has been common. Okay. Now, in addition, I speculate as to whether or not there's a periphery. I hate to say this in a room full of originalists, or at least some originalists, but is there a p p p penumbra beyond the core irreducible meaning of the, of the Section 1 prohibitions, where there is some judicial power to enforce. Okay. And here I think there is some room for difference because of the ambiguity of the text, because of the unclarity of the history. But I posit this thesis, that where the court has ventured beyond this minimum and purported to choose a specific interpretation of the 14th Amendment's provisions that go beyond the necessary irreducible meaning, the logic and structure and history of uh, the 14th Amendment suggests that Congress should be able to displace those choices and say, we disagree with your interpretation. Okay, so what does this mean? In one minute or less, okay, for the Privileges or Immunities Clause, I think there's a necessary core meaning of incorporation of the Bill of Rights. I think it is also a fair understanding, necessary understanding, that Congress would have had power to implement the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Beyond that, there was a deliberate choice of language that was indeterminate and vague so as to admit a range of congressional policy enforcement. I have more to say about privileges or immunities, but I'm sure you'll ask. As to equal protection, I think there's a clear, irreducible, necessary meaning that the 14th Amendment was a self-executing -execu command that laws of states not discriminate on the basis of race or any other form of caste legislation. Beyond that determinate core, there is a fair range of disagreement as to congressional scope of power to enforce laws that do not require state action as a predicate and to establish different uh, 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 views of proof and understanding of what the Equal Protection Clause would require. Uh, as to due process, I believe that there is a determinate core meaning of due process of law uh, that's very tightly limited as an original matter but that Congress would have power to exercise basically supervisory authority over many state judicial and legal 
uh, uh, procedures and that that would be within Congress's power. In some of these areas, it is fair to say that the court could reach interpretations on its own even if Congress has not acted. But the premise of my article, my paper in progress, is that Congress would always have the power to choose a different policy if it fell legitimately within the range of interpretation admitted by this broad language. That means Congress could overrule Miranda in Dickerson, could overrule MAP, clearly could overrule City of Bernie with something like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, should have been uh, granted the power to, to reach the conclusions it did in passing the Civil Rights Act of 1875. The civil rights cases are wrong. So obviously this is not an explication of current judicial doctrine. It is a radical critique of it. I'm sure there are a hundred things wrong with it, and I'm sure Earl will point out 75 of them. 